what up guys welcome to the new american dream podcast i'm your host george gibson that was a good one all right yes this week's show is awesome we got a, a superstar on the show today and before we get to the show i just wanted to talk to you about what's going on in my life that one of the keys to my success that i'm learning to focus on is being organized i have so many different things going on and i tend to not write everything down on my calendar so, uh, like, like usually when I go out of town, I have to I have to make sure I set up a system where people know what needs to get done and to make sure bills get paid. Everything just automation. But when I come returning back home, I'm doing all these small tasks and everything. It's just it's time. It take up time, and I'm able to allocate other people to do it. So, um, with watching this episode today, I want I want you to think about where is your time most valuable at. And, you know, one thing is paying bills. Paying bills, you can set up automation. Saving money, you can set up automation. Try to automate your life so that you can have free time to do things that are more important. Today's guest, she's young, 20 years old, and she has a whole business. And not just a business, she has a team surrounded around her to make her business grow and to continue to grow even when she's not present. So... I want you to watch this episode today. We have a guest. She is a TikTok superstar with over 800,000 followers. And she's not making funny videos. She's making financial videos. Can you imagine that? 800,000 followers with making videos about financial literacy, how to get better at finance. So no more. Let's get to the show. We have Taylor Price. Let's go. All righty. Welcome to the show. We have uh, Taylor Price. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. So, all right, let the people know like a little bit about, about who you are and what you do. In a few brief sentences, I am just finishing up college, so technically a college student, a full-time business owner, and a full-time finfluencer, financial influencer that talks about money for Gen Z. Yes, and that, I mean, that's how I discovered you when I seen your Instagram. I'm like, she is making finance look fun, I guess you could say. Try yeah, to make it look fun. fun. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was it was different. So all right, let's start from the beginning. Where where did you grow up from? Upstate New York, so uh Catskill area. It's not really a city. There's farmland, kind of suburban area. Okay. And would you consider yourself like middle class, poor growing up? How would you? Middle class, yeah, yeah middle class okay and also what like what did your parents do far as when you, when you was little yeah my parents own an industrial uniform rental company it's a very small locally owned business so think of um track off mats and think of like bar mops it's it's a laundry for like chefs uh tablecloths you think of stuff like that so it's very laborious, a lot of manual labor, a lot of disgusting, dirty rags, um, basically that, that I grew up in, like helping out at the shop and stuff. So, yeah. So you, do you think, you know, growing up around that, did that like influence you to become so intrigued in finances? Like were you talk, guys talking about money a lot and they like, were you aware? No, actually money was like something that we didn't really discuss. And if we did, my mom would always say like, we're on a very strict budget. We can't get this right now. We can't get that because we're on a strict budget. And in 2009, it really hit my family hard going with the recession. And so during that time, finance wasn't even a concern for me. It was, you know, I was nine years old then. Um, I'm right. 20 right now. It was going uh, into pre-med and actually becoming a neurosurgeon. So growing up, I've always wanted to be a doctor. And that's what I actually went to my first semester of college for, but things didn't work out. I have a spinal fusion myself um, from scoliosis, which is for those of you listening who don't know, it's an abnormal curvature of the spine. So think of like your spine as an S shape. And so that really took a big toll on my life. And I realized when I was in my first semester of college, I could not go into med school for 12 to 14 years when I didn't even know what, what, how my illnesses are going to be. I don't only have 
scoliosis. I have lupus as well. And then I have thyroid issues as well too. And so that's when my mom's like, Hey, maybe you should try finance. My dad's not college educated whatsoever. He doesn't really believe in the school system. My mom says, Hey, you need the credibility. You should at least go try this. And so that's what happened. And I realized that school does a terrible job with t discussing taxes, discussing how to budget for your retirement, any money management, simple investing. And then even just getting out of the concept of working from a nine to five to actually starting your own side hustle and turning into a business is something that's so foreign in the school system. So I started this blog around my community with my frustration and being so upset that I wasn't be I wasn't able to be taught from the school system and my parents didn't really talk about it at home. My friends didn't really talk about it. My friends' parents didn't talk about it. My aunt, uncle, nobody really talks about their finances or like how to improve. And so when I started this blog, it really started to gain some traction around my community. And that's when I had a friend out in LA. He's like, Taylor, you have to go on social media with this. There's this platform called TikTok. It is going to be like amazing for you. You have such a great and powerful message. You're not the only one who experiences financial stress and pain. So many other people do. And this was back in 2019, early 2019. So TikTok back then was like, Younger brothers and sisters were using right. it. Like, we were not <laughs> using and, and it. Gary V kept saying, get right. on TikTok. Get on. I'm like, yep. what is TikTok? It's not like a kid game. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, all exactly. of a sudden, it just blew up. Exactly, exactly. And I happened to be at the right place, right time. So December 2019, I went out to LA to do some business. And I said, hey, might as well try TikTok. I'm here. This is the place to do it, if anywhere. Like, a place in upstate New York that's going to be like looking weird. And so at that time I was kind of self-conscious, but when I was out there, I did it. And my 10th video in or so went viral. And then from there, it's just been like an explosive journey of closing this financial literacy gap. Right. That's crazy. All right. Yeah. So because I, I'm more into real estate and it's um on bigger pockets, this real estate podcast, they was talking about, it's not many financial real estate people on TikTok. So mm -hmm. they were like, if you get on there, it's like Instagram is like a million real estate investors. Yeah. Like, oversaturated. Mm -hmm. But TikTok, because it was pr like supposedly for kids, is not that many, you know, real estate finance people on there. So it's a great opportunity. So mm -hmm. when I seen your, like is TikTok, I think you go at it a different way as far as your, um, would you, what would you call it? Post? TikTok yeah, yeah, post? yeah. Content creation. Yeah, I definitely do. So just like we talked about before, like I make it fun. Finance is typically a subject that really, really hurts people. Like people don't like talking about it. So many friends I know their parents have gotten a divorce because of financial stress and financial burden. So many college students, some of my friends are drowning in student loan debt. And so it's not really a topic they want to bring up because it just brings them so much anger, stress, frustration. And so the way in which I kind of go about it is make it fun, enlightening, engaging. I do a lot of zoom in, zooming out. I always present with a smile because that's the first way that you always have to, a smile just brings light to somebody's eyes. And if you're like talking about finances, like a boring professor, then guess what? They're not going to watch and they're not, it's just going to be the same stigma that finance is boring. It's not cool. It's something that hurts you unlike me challenging the status quo, making it fun, making it exciting, making it engaging. Right. And, and, that, and you're right. That's how I noticed your video. I'm like, she's smiling, talking about financing. Yeah. Who's going to watch that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. all right. I know people don't really know. Uh, you, you didn't say, how many followers do you have on TikTok? Right now, I mean, it's been growing. I just got a, a 10 million viral video. And so right now it's at eight, 830,000. Jeez, 830,000 followers on TikTok. Yeah, that's, it, that's, just, it doesn't seem like that much. Like, it's so weird. Like, growing up, I also was really interested in, like, video editing and photography. And I always looked up to a whole bunch of th these different social media influencers and YouTubers. Like, Graham Stephan is somebody who talks about personal finance on YouTube. And... I'm like, wow, he has like a few million followers. He's untouchable. I can never say anything to him. 
But now that I'm in a similar position where I have, I do have a following, I do have a platform and people like come on the phone and I do like coffee chats just to talk with people and meet my following. They're like, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't know what to say. I'm so like nervous. <laughs> I'm like, guys, I'm just a normal person. Like what? Yeah. So you are out of on your TikTok, what's like the number one question for finance like you always get right now? I would definitely have to say it's just credit. Like there's so many people, especially within my demographic, it's really like 16 to 24 year olds. And so a, a lot of them are just starting out with credit or want to get started on credit early or are just out of state and they have, may have a different situation. Their parents may have a bad credit score. So it's just so many topics revolving around credit. And it's especially a controversial one because some people are taught in school to not have credit cards. And I totally think that's like false unless you are drowning already in so much debt. Maybe you shouldn't spend on credit, but if you're financially okay right now, uh, building credit and having a good credit score will allow you to get a mortgage. You know, I mean, in real estate, it'll allow you to, you know, go to college and pay for something that you don't have the capital or money per se to do so. Right. And uh, the most of the things I hear about, like, father, I'm a realtor, so I help people buy homes. And one of the main things is people neglected their credit at an early age. Mm -hmm. So they're in that process of trying to build it back up. I'm working on my credit. I'm working on my credit. Mm -hmm. What are some like, are there, like, I know there's a lot of things you can do to raise your credit, but what are like the most impactful things that people can actually like physically do to get from like maybe 500 to 620 or 650? So a lot of people, again, like I say, they put finances on the back burner. And so one of the easiest ways to just make sure that you're not going to get bad credit is to turn on automatic payments. This is something like a easy, the easiest tool that you can use. You don't have to remind yourself, oh my goodness, I forgot my statement and now I have to pay and now I'm going to reap the um, terrible fact that you're going to have a bad credit score if you don't pay on time. So first, Turn on that automatic payments. Make sure that you put it within your budget that you're able to pay off those payments. And then I would definitely have to say as well to don't overspend on the credit card. You're not really supposed to spend upwards of 30% or more because you will actually damage your credit score in the long run. This rule does not make sense to me at all because if you if you spend 100% of your credit card and you're able to pay 100% off, like why would it damage you? But it does, unfortunately. And so make sure you just put minimal stuff on your credit card. I like to do it in a way where I have like my gas expenses on a credit card or recurring subscription on a credit card. Um, that just makes it easy. Right. And one of the key things you said right then was it doesn't make sense because a lot of times people like, well, this makes more sense. So let me do this. Well, mm -hmm. you have to follow the rules. Like in real estate, I know, like I tell people all the time, if you stay in a home for two years, you can sell it for up to half a million dollars tax free. Like mm -hmm. you don't have to pay taxes on that money. So that's not like, it's, it's just a rule. You got to play by the rules in order to get ahead, you know? Mm hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more like this. So there's so much that we have to do for for the next decade or so and change the whole conversation about financial literacy and some of these topics that like, wouldn't you think that if you're able to spend a 100% limit, let's say you have a $10,000 credit limit and you spend all that $10,000 and you were able to pay it back off very quickly. It makes sense. You think sense. that would be a boosting thing. your credit score and you're able to pay that off, but really you're not and you're damaging it really, really badly. It's crazy. Wow. So, yeah. So it doesn't make sense, but at least if you know it, you can know how to, you know, mm -hmm. use it, get multiple credit cards and just don't go too over that 30%. Right. Ratio. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. This, what is, what is your, um, why? Like, like you, you, you have people with finances. What's your long-term like big goal? Cause you said over a decade, we got a lot of work to do. What's like, like, yeah. Uh, ultimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like to call what I what I'm doing is trying to conquer the financial literacy gap and it being a silent pandemic. So I like to relate it as a silent pandemic because 
first off, we're living in COVID. Second off, we've been living in the silent pandemic of financial literacy gap. And the reason it's a pandemic is because guess what? You and me are not the only ones that have had concerns about money. Everybody at least once in their life has had some concern about money or some financial stress or some financial um, burden or question that they had no idea about. And then second part, silent, is that money is not a conversation to have about normally with people. Like growing up, I was told not to talk about money, religion, and politics at the table. And I'm pretty sure a lot of other people were told the same exact thing. So my goal is to challenge the status quota, which is talking and bringing conversations and building communities about people who want to talk about finances. And in return, hopefully people get to become financially literate or financially savvy and they don't have to go the same route that maybe their parents were in or maybe their grandparents were in or friends family that kind of thing so overall yeah. trying to close the financial literacy gap it's a yeah. big mission but it's worth it's it. a huge mission to do because yeah. you know the thing about it is like you only you know about financial literacy from your household so you know i know from watching my parents my parents don't watch their parents and one of the things my mom always say, um, her parents just taught her to make money and save it. The third, the hardest step, I think, is to invest it and grow it, mm -hmm. you know? So if you were just taught to go to work, make money, save 10%, and that's a happy life. And mm -hmm. back, I think back then, the, the main thing that changed in life is, nowadays, the cost of living. Like, a lot of people don't own homes at 30 years old. They're still living with parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got friends that be, they like, man, I need to buy a house, buy a house. But the cost of living is just, it's, it's, it's high now. So yeah, very it's high. harder for people. So what would you say are some of the things people can do to, at the first stage, earn more side money if they got a, a normal job, but they earn extra income? Yeah, so first off, to, to kind of discuss that question, I wouldn't say investing is the very best place to start off with. I like to imagine this thing called the money tree again it's a concept that we are all grown up saying that it doesn't exist but i think it does exist imaginary and i'm going to kind of explain it to you so there's this seed right all all trees start off with a seed and that's budgeting in order to that for that seed to actually start germinating and grow into like a small sapling or tree you have to have some good credit score. You have to start investing into your retirement within your simple budget. You have to just have basic money management skills. You have to have a three to six months worth of emergency savings or an emergency fund. And then finally you get this like small tree and that's really when you get to the upwards part where guess what the leaves are. That's what the money is. Right? right. And so you start creating these different branches and remember branches are not as stable as the trunk. Right? So what you can control is your budget starting off. You can control your credit score. You can control how much you invest into a Roth IRA. You can control how much you put into your savings account. But the stuff up top is stuff that's not guaranteed. For example, turning your side hustle into a business, uh, investing in real estate, just investing in the stock market and investing in cryptocurrency. It's all stuff at the top that can eventually make you money and make you a passive income and really talk about and grow this money tree, which we're all not told that exists. But it's something that really, really is beneficial, but it's not guaranteed. And that's why I call it the trees, because these branches are not as stable. Like the stock market fluctuates. Sometimes there's recessions. Sometimes the mortgage in the housing industry falls. Sometimes cryptocurrency falls and rises too. So you can't 100% rely on it. But it's something that can make you money um, in the future. That, that, was, that was a great illustration because I pictured that Trump with all the credit and, you know, your bank account. That was yeah. the main, that's the main meat. Yep. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the key. I think like, that's like an athlete lifting weights and they lifting weights to go play a sport, mm -hmm. but you got to be strong and in shape in order to even play a sport. Yeah, so, exactly. Dang, that, that was a good illustration. So for people listening, I think the main thing is definitely number one, if you're just starting to think about finances is 
focuses on saving, budgeting, and getting mm-hmm. your credit right because that's the core to do anything after that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what are some ways that you um, suggest people to earn passive income that are your favorite right now? Because I know it changed. Yeah. Yeah. So investing in the stock market is something that's very um, simple. Well, not exactly simple, but it's one of the easier ones, I think. And it takes a little less time than something like turning your side hustle into a business. Like entrepreneurship is a hard, lonely, very tough road, but investing in the stock market is something that Again, you can buy Coca-Cola or you can buy an index fund and you can start investing into companies that have dividend payments. And for those of you listening who don't know what dividend payments are, they're basically cash payments just for owning a piece of the company. So if you own a piece of Coca-Cola stock, that means that you'll receive a payment. Um, It's either each and every month or quarterly, semi-annually, or annually cash. And you can decide to do two things with that cash. You can take it, go out, get sushi, get whatever you want, get the new Xbox, or you can go out and reinvest that money, which I would choose. It's called drip investing. And you can start creating generational wealth. Albert Einstein said compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. And by reinvesting, you're just creating a bigger payout every single time. Right. It's the long term, long game. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So like you you say you're 20 years old. What like you at first you went to college for a semester. One of the most common things I have on the podcast is guests oftentimes go through something in life that make them. You see how you say you had the scoliosis and the lupus and that like that triggered your mind to say, wait, every day is not promised. So let me live, you know, now. That's how you feel now, kind of, instead of, like, just Most, taking life as a breeze? Yeah, I, I literally get this question from everybody that I, I ever encounter, like, how am I so productive? How am I doing things at such a young age? Like, I'm finishing my bachelor's in two years. I, I have three businesses. I now have a social media following. How are you doing this? And I really testify everything to June 23rd, 2014, when I got my spinal fusion surgery and, like, shit was terrible for like two years. I was going to the doctors nonstop. I had to relearn how to walk. I, my what body. Age, what age was this? 14, 14. So it was like a really pivotal, pivotal moment where I was, it was in the summer of eighth and ninth grade. So I started off high school with people having to carry my books, open wow. the door for me, carrying my backpack. I had to spit, sit in a special desk. It was like, a huge life-changing moment and then on top of that like I said that's when we found out I was diagnosed with lupus I I have some thyroid stuff going on as well and my scoliosis started to get worse again even after the surgery so I had to go in for a second surgery and then after a while you just realize like (laughs) after so many doctor's appointments so many surgeries and and so many like medically induced illnesses or whatever like you realize the value of every second and you really figure out okay this is what i want to do in life and you understand like i don't have hundreds of years right there's only a finite amount of time that you have to live make every second count like people talk about that saying a lot but some i don't think like really know what it means like you may say like live your life to the fullest but what you have to, I feel like you have to be at your lowest point in order to be the best that you can be in the future, if that makes sense. You have to be at your lowest point. All right. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. But my question is, because I think, like, even me, I went through something that made me go chase my dreams. And it's like, do a person, because I look at other people and they're like, it's just going through life, like, yeah, whatever happened, happened. Yeah. Do a person have to, do a person you think you have to have a life changing experience in order to be that motivated because like Kobe Bryant died at, I think the age of 40 something. Right. And yep. I tell people all the time, Kobe Bryant lived longer than people that are 80 and 90 years old. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? To you? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He, but he's been through so many more experiences and through his ability with the basketball, he's been able to 
you know, build generational wealth for his family. He's been able to travel all around the world. He's been able to attend different like celebrity meetings, all the stuff that people like never get to experience even in their lifetime. So right. I totally agree with that statement. Yeah. And, and that's why I tell a lot of some people, they'd be dying at 40 and 50, but they live longer than people that are 90. Cause you yeah. ask uh, 90, old, what did you do? You know, with your life? Oh, I worked for the sugar plant 40 years. Yeah, exactly. It's like, Oh my gosh, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, so, and then, um, this is another person I want you to check out is on, cause it's on YouTube. Cause I knew even when I seen your video, I didn't know you went through something, but I was like, uh, you don't really care what people think you're doing what you're supposed mm -hmm. to do and you can it come out your pores, you know? Yeah. So, um, this is another guy on YouTube. His name is Miles Monroe and he is like a motivation speaker or whatnot, but he always say that the, um, most of the best dreams and gifts are in the graveyard mm -hmm. because people like they had a dream. Imagine you didn't go chasing this dream and you just went to school and got a normal job. And it's like, but this was burning inside you and you just die. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's how most people go through life. Yeah. That's what the school system trains us to be though, too. Like I bring it all back to the school system. Like, in elementary school, middle school, and high school, like creativity starts slowing down. Like from third grade, you get made fun of, or there's like so much bullying going around for kids who like try to be creative and want to express who they are, but aren't able to. And the school system kind of shuts that down. And then the second thing is again, that entrepreneurial path, like entrepreneurs in the school system are like people who are unemployed yet are trying to make it out in life but can't and they don't get any paychecks um and so that's like the stigma that's so falsified like right. i know so many entrepreneurs yes it took sweat and grind um sweat blood and tears but guess what that ended up proving much better than they would have been being in a nine to five job because now guess what they can go travel for two to three weeks while somebody else takes care of their business for them right and you know the crazy part is you know i quit my job i was a mailman for like five years mm -hmm. and i quit last year and you know i quit last year and when i quit like everybody at the post office was calling me crazy like oh especially yeah. people been at 20 30 years they were like that's a big mistake he made mm -hmm. and all this stuff and you know what them same people now are calling me asking me hey How'd you um get into real estate? Yep. It's like they're they want to do it now because it inspired them because they see, like, yeah, I, when I quit, I was making less money. But eventually you keep chasing your dream and purpose. Eventually, you know, if you don't give up, it's gonna start to pay off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another tip too, surrounding yourself with the people who who you want to be the most like. So if you're in an environment where you're in a corporate bubble and you're like sitting at your office, well, obviously coronavirus is still happening and some people aren't at their office, but think of like old cubicles that everybody hates the job there. They don't want to be there. Well, guess what? You're going to be freaking miserable. If you want to like really go out and get ahead, start easiest way to do that is start following people on social media that are doing what you want to do and start surrounding yourself with people like yourself, if you want to get into real estate, guess what? Go give it a follow and go check out the content and start learning, start asking questions instead of like laying down in your past and not really being motivated or wanting to do anything in life just because of the surroundings you're in. Right. All right. So, all right. When most people, they get paid, you know, on Friday, what if you was going to pay check, say you get paid maybe $1,500 every two weeks, what's the first thing you would do if you got your paycheck for fifteen hundred dollars. Put it within my budget. So depending on budgets are so complicated in the sense that everybody has different financial needs. Um, so categorize your needs, your wants, and your savings. For example, some people, like you said, are still living with their parents, so they may not be paying rent or they may not be paying food, and so their needs may be really low, and so therefore they can start contributing. A majority, let's say 70% of their paycheck towards savings, 20% towards wants, 10% towards needs. Um, and by doing so, creating these three categories, you can one, um, 
establish that good credit that we're talking about by making sure that you're able to pay off those needs or pay off those wants. You're able to start investing, which is something that's not really taught when you're young. Um, and you can start saving for different goals. Maybe somebody's goal is to travel to Greece. Maybe somebody's goal is to get a new car. Maybe somebody's goal is to just save money just for the hell of it. So right. that's, that's what I'd recommend doing. Um, another thing that is really good too for $1,500 paychecks, I think are really outdated. So ask your employer if they have direct deposit. Well, I didn't mean literally paychecks. I mean, just got paid. You know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you are getting paid like a salary or just whatever, like a paycheck, for example, and you do this direct deposit, many employers have the opportunity to split that paycheck into two accounts, your checking and your savings. So they can do it automatically where you say, I'm going to put 70% of this paycheck into my savings account, and I'm going to put 30% into my checking account. And this makes it very easy. Again, it's automated. We already have so much on our plate in this life. Why not make this automation very easy and our finances even easier? Right. And that's some things I do too, because if, I don't know if you're here, like people say, like, if you're fixing a plate of food, um, if you fix a big portion, you're going to try to eat it all. But mm -hmm. if you got a small portion, you probably just eat that and be full. So mm -hmm. for me and with money, I put like the money I'm trying to save, I put it in an account where I don't have a card to it. And mm -hmm. basically, I don't, even, I don't even think I got online, well, I probably got online to it, but I don't check it. Because yeah, exactly. If I if, I, if we go to the bank that I use every day, I end up spending more money because you see it. So, like you mm -hmm. said, allocating that money even to a different account and then hide it on your online thing or a different bank at all, mm -hmm. I think it helps me save more money. I do the same thing. Yeah, I have a, a saving one of my savings accounts in American Express Personal Savings. And you have to like go through multiple steps on the American web, uh, American Express website to actually get to it. So I'm like, oh yeah, I forget that I have um, some savings in here. And, and you, yeah. the fact that you got to go through them steps, you think yeah. twice about even getting money. Yep, <laughs> exactly. That, that is great. So really you should make, because think about it, if you save money in your house in a shoebox and you need $20 to get some food, oh, you just go to the shoebox. Yep. But if it's in that bank account and it's Sunday, it's like oh, I can't, I don't, I can't get it. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what are what are some things that not not things, but what is something that you sp splurge your money on? Like you spend a lot of money for this, maybe in your business and your personal life, but you can't live without it. But it costs a lot. Food. So I'm not one to like cook a lot. I'm actually on a juice cleanse. Uh, right now because I've just been eating like so much pizza and takeout, different Uber Eats or, or DoorDash. Um, right. I just don't, I, I don't make the time within my schedule to prepare food and make, make meals. I'd rather um, try and save or time to do either content creation or just finishing up school or doing work creation or just finishing up school or doing work. Like I said, I have a like, super busy schedule. And so, um, rather just get <laughs> Uber Eats that I need, obviously, right. to, to eat and nourish myself. Um, but probably not the best financial choice, I, I must admit, but it's something that I do include in my budget. <laughs> right. Yeah. That is funny. So you don't even ask the cost of the food. You'd be like, it look good. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Kevin Hart, he was saying, because you're cleansing what? You're drinking juice for what, days or a day? I just started it today. So I have six juices that I have to drink. This is my third one. Um, this is my second time doing this. Um, last one I did was a few years ago. And I remember just feeling like after the cleanse, uh, not tired, not fatigued. I think it's just good to replenish your body. Um, especially, like I said, if I'm eating like all this Uber Eats, like who knows what they're putting in. <laughs> so you drank six juices in one day or? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, um, how do you recommend, uh, like far as investing, do you recommend people using debt to invest or just using, um, cash? Like cause me, evidently I'm in real estate. I leverage money in order to make money. Do mm -hmm. you recommend people using debt or like 
Dave Ramsey, no debt. Yeah. Again, it, it totally depends on your financial circumstance. Like if you're, I would say if you're older and you have an established job, there's no harm in using a margin account. Um, and a margin is where you can leverage um, the broker's money and you can pay for, you can basically get a stock for those who are listening um, that don't necessarily have the money currently right on them. Um, but for somebody who's like young and a college student and maybe facing debt themselves already, definitely only use cash, especially if you're a beginner. Again, this is like question is like so, wide so range. broad. Yeah, yeah so yeah, wide. If you're a beginner, cash accounts are the way to go, meaning you're only allowed to buy what you have in the bank account. Um, and then once you're, I guess, intermediate or kind of professional, if you want to say, then margin accounts are acceptable. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, all right. Just imagine, all right, we're in this big old world, right? And this human voice came down and whispered in your ear and they were like, you are the best at this. This is your gift. Like, what would you think that gift would be? Or like, like, what is something you just great at or your purpose you feel like? Um, I would definitely, I, I would think I would have to say communication. Um, I'm really able to connect to anybody, whether it be like a five-year-old and I'm able to speak with them <laughs> and they understand me and I understand them, or whether it be like a 90-year-old and they've been through it all and uh, I can still relate to them because like I said, my, my spinal fusion surgery has made me almost that mature, like older people that normally go to the doctor's appointments, um, like, you know, every single week when they're old, like I've been through there, I've done that. I resonate with those people, but also like my creative aspects with imagination and curiosity and asking questions to like the younger generation. So I definitely have to say communication and empathy. Right. Yeah. So you basically, you're tricking the youngster because you still got like that old nineties or 2000, like you understand the old age things to do way, but you can present it in a new age way. Yep, exactly. That's a perfect way to put it. <laughs> I might have to take that. <laughs> That's what you're doing because I'm thinking about like, all right, yeah, you're saying stuff my my older parents and uncles should hear, but you're presenting in a way where the new people think is, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because I think the world honestly it's like everybody's getting so much information off social media and them because that it's gonna make everybody be better with financing. Everybody be better with everything because it's so easy to learn now. You know, you just go on Instagram and you can follow somebody who's doing it and they showing it every day, just mm -hmm. watching. Okay. I, yeah, I agree. So what's something um, that people do with finances that just tick you off? Like they, like somebody might tell you they did this and you just like frustrated. Cause it's uh, a bad, it's a bad money move they made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, personally think that I mean it's okay like to get coffee like buy coffee from a Dunkin or a Starbucks every single day as long as you include it in your budget and you realize the money at the end of the year that could have been been placed into a Roth IRA that'll literally make you millions when you're a lot older so that's I, I wouldn't don't say, say like millions that. I would say maybe like 50,000 I don't know I don't believe in that concept like the don't, Roth IRA? No, no, no. Like they'd be like, uh, you know, if you spend three dollars on a coffee every day, you could have over a year made a million dollars. No, I'm saying if you invested, if you invested that money. So let's say like people are spending on average less than five thousand a year on coffee from like a luxury thing, not just gas station coffee that costs right. like ninety nine cents, but like a Starbucks that could upwards cost you eight or nine dollars or right. Duncan like five or six or something like that um, and taking that money and putting it into a Roth IRA which uh, has an average of 10 percent uh, annualized return per year so if you just invested that money two right. years you would have already been able to buy like three coffees in a day rather than one right mm -hmm. but what if that coffee make you make more money that's a good question. <laughs> you know, no, nah, it's just funny because I think everybody has to manage their own money to their person, um, personality. Right. Like me, that's something like I can't keep track of that because mm -hmm. if I'm worried about that, I can't even go do this. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. Like, yeah, yeah. Big, I guess I only see the big picture because 
even like when I was working my job, I never could see like the, like I'm putting this piece of paper right here every 10 minutes. And I'm like, why are we putting that paper there? Oh, okay. That's, you know, I only see the big picture of the whole mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, all right. These are like the final questions. Just wrap it. First thing come to your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could spend a day with like your mentor, somebody you can pick their brain, who would it be? This is a good question. I got her. She got stuck. I, I honestly don't know. I, like, I don't even think about that kind of stuff. I'm not, I'm actually not into like pop culture, like following too much into like what's going on with who and, and where. I'm more into like global news. And so to actually define like a person or influencer or personality, I... I'm not sure. I, I, I actually, I'd probably have to be, this is going to be like a lame answer. You guys probably won't know her, but her name is Christina Lake. She's the CEO and founder of Stitch Fix, which is the first ever company that's been led by the youngest female um, entrepreneur to go public. Right. Um, so she br basically broke an industry standard and I like, I think she was like 30. Um, and so I love to have a conversation with her on like how she was able to do that and just kind of pick her brains if i had to choose somebody if you had to choose somebody yeah. yeah we don't know who that is but i'm pretty sure that's a brilliant person mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> all right best life advice you go by organization is the key to success if yeah if you if you don't have a plan you're planning for failure jeez Ooh. That hurt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right. How do your friends and family like? Do they cringe up when you come in the room? Because our oh, she's trying to talk about Taylor, trying to talk about money. No, 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 uh, no. I actually, I actually don't talk about it as much. Like I talk about it so much on my content channels that I, it's not even something that I think about because I'm talking to thousands of people at a time um, about money. And so when I'm with my family, it's not really about um money or it's not too much about business it's more like how hey how are you guys doing how's it going um either just some funny things how's the food <laughs> but but in, in, in reality think about it how many people that age gonna ask a 20 year old for financial advice even though you could give them great advice but they like no, she don't know nothing it's it's crazy. My dad my dad talks about me sometimes to his friends and they're like, Teach me how to invest. This is absolutely amazing. You're a wizard. And I'm like, Oh my god. <laughs> like this is not um this Normal. is like Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that 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 is yeah, that, some adults might not even want to take you. Like say you was a financial advisor and they walked in the room, they were like, Oh no. You know, just because of the stereotype, like she can't know that much about finance. That's another thing that, yeah, yeah, that I experience on social media is that, oh, she's a 20 year old. Um, she's a girl, like either one, get back into the kitchen or two, how do you know so much? Like you're only 20. And people don't realize that I literally dedicated years on end studying, giving up my social life to understand these different concepts in the amount of time that I did. Like people normally don't finish a bachelor's degree in two years, but I cut the two years off and I did it and I'm doing it and I finished tomorrow. So wow, congrats. two years. Oh man. What's your major? Finance and management. Oh, I should have knew that. Yeah. You did it in two years. I guess you have to pay for a course to find out how you did it in two years, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But, uh, all right. Um, what are your hobbies outside of, no, I want to ask you this. Um, because I'm on Instagram, I'm not on TikTok, but on TikTok, what is something that you do to, you think, um, attract the views and followers? What is something like people can do to gain more followers? Consistency. Consistency is key as well too. just showing up every day for your followers, or if you can't do it every day, at least create a schedule like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So people know when your videos are coming out. It is the most annoying thing when you follow somebody and then out of the blue, they're just no post anymore. You gain like a frustration and like a, a being upset with the person like you, where did you go without saying anything? You know what I mean? And so it's like your friend, like going, if you guys were going to go to the movies, and your friend just didn't show up. I think you would be kind of upset or be like, what, 
what, what just happened. So I would definitely have to say being consistent, just showing up for your following through your family and friends at the end of the day. So and you're at that perfect age where you can like keep I'm 31 years old and it's like I like my phone, but I don't like it that much. You know what I mean? I'm the same way, <laughs> believe it or not. I actually post I actually create a schedule. So on Sundays, I try and film all of my TikToks for the week. So oh. that throughout the week, I'm not on my phone all the time scrolling. Like I'm a very meticulous person in that sense too. Like I'd rather not be on the phone than be on the phone. Right. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in that boat. It's just a matter of figuring out like your, your time schedule. If you can just dedicate one day to spend some time creating Content. seven videos or something like that to post the rest of the week, then you're good. You don't have to spend time on your phone throughout the week and you don't have to make any excuses for not posting because you already made the content. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's a good one. I'm just thinking about even because even when I try to, sometimes I get brain fart on coming up with content and it's like, I was looking at your video and you was all over the place and it was like, it never ends. <laughs> yeah. I, because I never shut off that curiosity or asking questions or creativity that high school and, and like grade school shuts off. Like I've been into like arts and thinking, um, like deep thinking my entire life. And so I can just like rattle off a whole bunch of different concepts and ideas, but it's a lot harder because the school system trains the majority of other people to turn that off and to just focus on memorizing these terms. Don't ask questions about it. That's it. How, how, what's your GPA like in high school? Um, I don't remember the, it was upwards of a 4.0. Um, wait, 4.0 is the highest. Wait. 4.0 is the highest, yeah, for in New York. I don't know how Florida. Yeah, is. Florida. Yeah, so you just making straight A's. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So no, I was just trying to figure out because that's almost like so you everybody can't just do what you're doing. That means you're like above average, you know, intelligence wise. I didn't study. I I didn't study in school. Like high school, I didn't study. I I messed around. I was a totally different person. Like. I would throw like crumbled paper across the room and play with like my guy friends and pretend it's like Call of Duty or something like that. I was like a guy's girl. I wasn't part of like a girl clique or anything like that. Um, so it was, yeah, the teachers would get upset and frustrated that um, with me that people couldn't like keep up, like my, my guy friends couldn't keep up with like me talking to them during class or, or something like that. And so. <laughs> I was maybe a little bit of a distraction, I guess, per se, but now it's surprising because almost all of that people, all those people in the group of friends are transitioning to finance as a major. Because I'm you, like, oh, isn't that interesting? <laughs> but you, do you plan on going to get like a corporate normal job now that you got your degree? No, 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 no. That is like the, <laughs> that is like the epitome <laughs> of hell for me. I never, ever, ever want to do a corporate nine to five ever. Ever. Yeah. So you basically, so eventually you would like to be, uh, if you're not working, a, you work for yourself at your own businesses. Yeah. Entrepreneurship. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will see you probably on like one of the big TV shows one day later. Yes. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> all right. So, all right. What's your version of the new American dream? The old American dream would be you would graduate college tomorrow and go get a job for maybe PNC or something, work there for 30 years, making $40 an hour, and then you retire and you can travel the world and yeah. be with your grandkids or something. What is your version of the new American dream? just the opportunity that we're presented today like we're breaking different stereotypes we're breaking the glass ceiling we're breaking um different job industry or standards with black lives matter with um latina and hispanic owned businesses like just the opportunity that we're now able to especially in 2020 that we're right. like really starting to see and hopefully in 2021 that will just explode and that opportunity was not there and definitely the old american dream so the new american dream that's where it's it that's where um we're headed and i'm so excited to help be the one to make that revolution um you as well too just by having this podcast and you know really changing that standard yeah because i think so many like it's now now nobody really want to work a, a normal job for the rest mm -hmm. of their life because mm -hmm. they see like that's not happiness mm -hmm. and people are seeing like 
if I was watching your life and I was working a job all day, I would get jealous. It's like, mm -hmm. what does a typical day look like for you? So busy. Like right out in, in five minutes, I actually have a mini workshop um, that I do. So it's really 9 a.m. I would have to say um, is when it starts. And lately it's been late, like eight, eight o'clock, nine o'clock ending, um, just with meetings, with posting, with finishing up school and finals, uh, just so much on my plate right now, but I'm taking a week off. I'm right. going away and I'm going to relax and have a, a nice time. So. All right. And keep turn the phone off. If I see you do yeah. one post. You're no, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, create all of my posts so that somebody else can post them, and we're good to go. Okay, so let the people know where they can find you at if they wanted to find you anywhere. Yeah, at Priceless Tay, P R I C E L E S S T A Y, Priceless Tay, and right. my name is Taylor Price. You can also search Taylor Price as well too. It's real. It's not a fake name. I get so many questions. Is like, oh, is your last name Price? Is that real? Because some people put their name as like finance or like capital. And yes, Price is real. Like I, I was born for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It, it's meant for you. Taylor Price. So it's Taylor Price on um, TikTok. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. Thank you for coming on the show and peace out. Thanks. All right.